Good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time zone that you're in. And thank you for joining us today. Um, people are st continuing to join. But in the meantime, uh, while people are joining, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items uh, for the webinar. All the registrants are muted right now, except for the panelists. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So at any point, if something occurs to you, uh, just go ahead and type it into the chat box at the bottom, and we will be taking those questions at the end. And if you don't see the chat box, if you're not sure where it is, you may need to go to the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click on the little orange arrow, and then you should see the chat box appear. We're also recording the webinar, so if you want to access any of the information uh, at a later time or you can't remember something important that was said, you will be able to get a recording of that and we'll also have the slides available for the webinar. Uh, we'll probably have those up by the end of the day today, but otherwise we'll have them up tomorrow morning. So um, I am going to turn over introductions to the Managing Director of SSTI, Eric Sundquist, and he will introduce everybody else. Great. Thanks, Robbie. Um, this is Eric Sundquist, and uh, I'm really glad that everybody has joined us today. Thanks to Rebecca for, um, she's going to lead us off and do a presentation to, to start off. She is a senior policy analyst at the Office of Policy at USDOT and the Secretary's Office, where she's led and supported policy initiatives, including Ladders of Opportunity, Beyond Traffic, and Grow America. Um, then I am going to, we're, we're going to hold questions till the end, um, but I am going to follow her up um, in, with her presentation on, on the um, USDOT connectivity initiative with uh, SSTI's own work on accessibility and accessibility and connectivity are very closely related and we can talk about talk about that as we go along. Um, I am the managing director of SSTI. SSTI, for those of you who haven't joined us before, is um, housed at the University of Wisconsin, is um, a network of about 20, it varies from time to time, 20 state DOT secretaries. Um, we organize communities of practice and do technical assistance and do um, reports and outreach and, and uh, communications like this very webinar. Um, we also have on the line for questions, he's not going to present, but Matthew Martimo from City Labs. And that'll be, he'll be particularly useful if someone has questions on my presentation, um, which is on accessibility, because we use a tool that City Labs has recently um, gone to market with called Sugar Access. So with that, um, Robbie, unless you have anything else, I think we should turn it over to Rebecca. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and switch the presentation over to Rebecca. And uh, you will have control of the slides, Rebecca. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me on to talk today. Um, Oh, I'm just not click, sure I'm able click to... on the, okay. in the middle of the slide, and that should give you. There you go. Great, thank you. <laughs> and now I recall that you did tell me that I had to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so this is sort of the the story Muted. of what I wanted to share today. Um, the, the the who, what, why of connectivity at USDOT. Um, so thank you again so much for having me here and, and for hosting this conversation. It's a really important topic that, um, that USDOT has been focused on for the last two years and trying to help advance the field and the state of practice. Um, we, we do recognize that there's still um, a lot left to learn and understand and, and that there are different approaches to take when it comes to actually developing a specific measure. measure. Um, so I'd say that, that we still think of ourselves as in the research phase, but anticipate a lot of opportunities to really leverage these measures uh, in the future. So I wanted to start with, nope, still not moving. Oh, there it goes. Um, just a basic definition. 
um, because I know that there are uh, uh, some subtle distinctions between accessibility and connectivity. I think basically they're the same, but connectivity is more of a concept for which there may be a variety of measures that could be used to assess different pieces of it. Um, basically, we're looking at how well does the transportation network provide access to essential services and other destinations. Um, the emphasis here really is on the network, that we're interested in a multimodal network, and that it's providing reliable access, that that, that access is affordable, um, and it's available to those who are walking or biking or using transit. Um, and getting them wherever they need to go. Connectivity is really a topic of particular interest in part because it's sort of at the intersection of numerous related initiatives and, and focus areas for the department. Um, affordable access, multimodal access to jobs and opportunities, and the types of street, st streetscapes and development patterns that can result from Connectivity, uh, these are major elements of the Ladders of Opportunity initiative, and the goal of promoting equity through transportation is, is also a part of that. So I'll speak more about Ladders of Opportunity um, in a minute, but then it's also, connectivity is also recognized as a significant gap in the performance management framework that was established um, for us in MAP21 and, and not changed in the FAST Act. Uh, so those performance measures um, in statute are, are, are somewhat conservatively circumscribed to kind of more traditional unmuted road condition and safety and congestion, etc. Um, and, and we know that you can be scoring well on all of those measures and still have a transportation system that doesn't really work for a significant portion of the population. And, and we think that that should be measured as part of the performance of the system. So connectivity is a big part of that. And then we also recognize that measures and analysis are becoming possible now due to vast increases in data and analytic capacity and new tools. Um, we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of this new ability, um, making smarter plans, better analyzing how our plans are performing, better understanding not only where people are and where and how they want to travel, but also where and how they aren't able to travel because of gaps in the transportation network. Uh, so connectivity measurements and the use of such a measure in planning um, to create stronger, more equitable communities is, is, is effectively at the convergence of all of these priority areas for us at USDOT. Oops, too far. Um, just a little bit more on ladders of opportunity and, and how that initiative is related to connectivity. This is a ma major priority area for Secretary Fox. Um, he firmly understands transportation infrastructure as the skeleton that communities are built on and therefore a critical factor for determining one's access to opportunity. Um, we know that transportation expenses are typically the second largest part of family budgets next to housing and the working poor spend nearly 10% of their income just commuting to work. Um, that's opposed to just 4% for the national average. And two-thirds of the new jobs that are being created are in suburbs which are too often not accessible without a car. Um, and of course, you know, lower income people are less likely to own a car and thus they're unable to reach those opportunities. And at the same time, 45% of Americans don't have any access to transit. So, so that's the connectivity element of Ladders of Opportunity. You know, we need to create reliable and affordable connections to employment, education, and other essential services in, in order to um, promote the equity for the nation. Um, but the initiative is also focused on transportation workforce and also on the way um, that the shape of the streets and the sidewalks and their design can either revitalize or damage the economy and the livability of the community. So Secretary Fox describes this as the streets not just connecting people from point A to point B, but also ensuring that all along that corridor, that road is making the place and the community better and stronger. Um, so building in a way that allows all of the residents to walk or take transit or spend less money getting around and in a way that drives significant private sector inv in investment and, and entices people to walk around and shop. Um, so overall, Ladders of Opportunities ensuring, is focused on ensuring that the infrastructure that we plan and build works for the community it's built in and supports the goals of equity, inclusion, access, and economic vitality. Um, so in 2014, 
the department released the Grow America proposal as reauthorization for MAP 21. And, and at that time, we were still sort of in the initial stages of thinking about and understanding connectivity. But we knew we wanted to expand the performance measures that had been authorized in MAP 21 to include a focus on connectivity. And at that time, we weren't exactly sure how to do that. So we sort of compromised and proposed to give ourselves some time to figure it out and through research, and then to propose a measure. Um, after the research, it, as long as it indicated that it made sense to do so. And Congress chose not to immediately enact our proposal, but effectively we just went ahead and began the research anyway on how to measure connectivity. And one of the first things that we did, oh, sorry. One of the first things we did was hold a connectivity summit in April of last year. Um, and I put the link up here because we have all of the slides um, and the presentations and also a summary of the discussion that we held at that. Um, and it was a great way to really understand the state of the practice and the research and to set a research agenda for ourselves. We had both practitioners and academics participating. And one thing that we found was that there was sort of a gap between the academics and the practitioners, sort of maybe a gap between an ideal and a practical approach. Um, and I think that the, the great thing is that in the last year, that's begun to narrow a little bit as, as tools like Sugar Access are coming on board. And I'm re really excited about that development. Um, so in the last year, we lined up a pretty broad research agenda. Um, and it, it's sort of an acknowledgment that we don't know the best way to go about measuring and making connectivity more tangible and concrete. And so we wanted to have the research be very broad and inclusive um, and encompass different approaches. Um, and it's also included some technical assistance components so we can make sure that it's practical and implementable. And in fact, this isn't actually even an exhaustive list, but, um, but it's some of our work uh, that's ongoing on connectivity and system performance. And uh, I'll just call out a couple of, of these items. Um, the Federal Highways Office that works on performance measures is undertaking a very significant study on multimodal transportation system performance measures. Uh, it's still in, this, in the early phases of research, but it has the goal of both developing an ideal measure for system performance and identifying the data that would be necessary to support that measure. And then also, from that, developing a measure that would be currently implementable with existing data. And, and connectivity is, is one piece of that multimodal system performance. Um, we're also working with the Governor's Institute on Community Design to develop a guidebook on measuring connectivity and to work with state DOTs that are leading the field in the use of performance measures um, and both providing some technical assistance to them, but then also learning from their experience as they, as they work to implement that. FTA is working on a number of activities, including some webinars and guidance on Title VI-based analyses and how that data can both be expanded with concepts of connectivity to understand the extents of service and access in minority communities. Um, and then we're also looking at some more traditional performance measures, such as level of service, um, to see how they might be phased out in favor of uh, improved and more um, subtle perhaps, uh, performance measures, such as ones on connectivity. We also have some, me uh, some research that is beyond just a specific measure, that's more about how uh, connectivity measures and analysis can enhance economic development, um, and how integrated planning can help support economic development. So we're working um, to understand how, how collaboration between levels of government can improve. Um, connectivity and economic development, and, um, and specifically on national highway system intermodal connectors. So the bulk of the work is in the research phase, but then there are some, also some things that are already being implemented. Um, I mentioned our Grow America proposals earlier. So while the performance measure that we would proposed wasn't taken up in the FAST Act, there are some new provisions that are related um, that were in the FAST Act that we're very excited about. Specifically, um, we have some new authorities on financing for transit-oriented development that I think it would be possible that that could benefit from measures of connectivity because the provisions talk about you know, um, 
uh, development that's functionally related to transit and or or within a certain walking distance and understanding whether we should just use a specific mileage distance or if it's if there's a way to indicate whether it's really accessible to transit uh, or if there are barriers to walking um, the latter step initiative has been underway for the last year. It's providing technical assistance to seven cities for a range of activities related to ladders of opportunity and attracting both um, public and private resources for transportation projects that help remove barriers and improve connectivity. Um, we also have a planning emphasis area on access to essential services, which is sort of connectivity by another name. Um, that's been a planning emphasis area for the last year, so there are now a wealth of webinars and other materials that have been developed to promote connectivity um, through that uh, initiative, and, and those are available on our website. And finally, uh, the Secretary is, is eager to promote the kinds of planning projects that he sees as supporting these goals of creating compact, connected communities, um, solving connectivity gaps, removing barriers, uh, and so he has a planning and design challenge in the works that he'll be announcing more details um, on soon, but that'll be a great opportunity to both understand uh, from like a list of example projects that he has, what, he, what he's hoping to promote, and then also to participate in a, um, in a, like a charrette on planning for connected communities. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Eric. Thank you very much, um, Rebecca. Let me just uh, get the switch over to Eric. And Eric, you can just click in the middle of the slide, and you should have control then. Great. Thank you, Robbie. And thank you, Rebecca. Really appreciate that. Um, I, we're, I'm going to um, take off in, from the point that Rebecca made about the narrowing gap between practice and theory, um, because despite my somewhat dry Muted. title here, um, we are actually now working in the field um, or getting closer to it in some cases with actual accessibility tools and measures. Um, there are I, I wouldn't say that everything around this has been figured out that needs to be figured out. Uh, we need nomenclature. I mean, the fact that we're calling it accessibility and connectivity, and it's essentially the same thing, and accessibility confuses people. They think it's ADA. We need standards to decide, you know, what is good accessibility and what's poor. We need to procedurally get in and break some silos up so that we're looking at cross modes and across ownership so that it's, you know, not even just basic auto accessibility involves more than the NHS or uh, that's a very sort of limited view. So there's still some, there's both, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even call it research so much because there's a, the, the research, at least in the, in the, in the uh, literature, is pretty much in. It's some decision making that we need to do in terms of what, what do we call things? What, what do we, when we see something that is, looks good or bad, how do we know and how do we communicate it? And how do we get it into the hands of practitioners? And as I say, that is starting to happen. So I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about um, our work with mainly state DOTs on this issue and the, these tools. But um, a lot of our slides are going to be, here we are in Madison, Wisconsin, SSTI Central. So a lot of our slides are going to show Madison because we have the license to use the tool here in Madison. We're soon to expand to Sacramento and use it in other places after that, I hope. But um, that's the reason you're going to see Madison here. Um, we're defining accessibility pr precisely as the time or distance it takes to reach destinations, and usually that it's time, because that's what really people care about. Um, you can, you know, more common measures of success in our field are around mobility, how fast are cars, usually could be also transit vehicles, rarely bikes or pads, moving um, at a point in the system. but um, Really, what people care about is getting to where they need to go. So speed and prox proximity both fig figure into the equation. Um, and that's great, because then it brings land use and transportation into the conversation as potential solutions or potential problems. Um, 
and we would like to apply it to all modes. The clocks at the bottom show that one of the limitations of just mobility only measures. Maybe folks on this call are, are familiar with that, but uh, if you look at Atlanta, the percentage of time spent in um, delay is, is less than Chicago, but it takes less time to get where you're going in Chicago. So by conventional measures, people might think um, Chicago's worse. So just one of the, one of the pitfalls of uh, mobility only. We think that accessibility, uh, as, the, as we're working on it, has a number of uses, including a scan of the system, a scan of the built environment, um, tracking performance over time, depending on what targets you set and, and what those scans look like over time, really detailed diagnoses of problems. Um, this, the, the tool that we're using is scalable almost infinitely, so neighborhood level problems all the way out to state and regional problems. Um, because the tool that we're using is on ArcGIS, it is relatively easy to uh, develop scenarios and look at the out outcomes. Um, there are some, some it's, accessibility per se isn't really a forecasting tool, but there are ways to use it that way. There are ways to, for example, look at relative accessibility between modes and predict what the mode split is going to be, um, and then, then alter that with a project. And then finally, accessibility, even though the term is a little bit con, con, you know, a little bit in contention, is pretty intuitive when you explain it to a, a non-technical or even a technical audience. Um, and it really can help in scenario planning and engagement in a way that more black box models and, um, and just uh, mobility type stuff might not. To calculate accessibility, you only need three things. Um, and in the tool that we're going to use, we have them all. The network, and that's the street network for cars, the bike ped network, the transit network, which is usually has become the GTFS, if you're familiar with that. Um, you need to know where the land uses are that you want to connect. So households, businesses, schools, uh, jobs, you name it. Um, and then you need a method to relate the two. Uh, we've been using, as has been repeatedly noted, sugar access from City Lab. Um, we are working somewhat cooperatively with Renaissance Planning Group, a uh, uh, DC-based, uh, or, or their DC office, I don't know if they're based there, um, which has done a lot of work in Virginia and Maryland on this question, and I'll see a couple slides in that. We tip our hat to our rival in the Big Ten, just up the road at the University of Minnesota, in their accessibility observatory, which as uh, Rebecca noted, has a pooled fund study and has done a lot to shine a light on this issue. Um, we do have a methodological difference with them, so we're not going to, so, oh, there they go. Um, so we're not going to rely on their method, but we do acknowledge their, um, uh, the role that they've played in bringing this forward, and, and so, and so uh, no disrespect by that visual there. Um, and this is really where we separate from them. Um, if you think about the value of a trip or the, the disamenity value of, of the cost of a trip in terms of time, the longer the trip is, the more costly it is. That's the underlying theory of um, demand models and uh, cost-benefit analyses and so forth. Um, and you can tell from observed behavior how much people are willing to travel, how far by what mode. So this is a, these are some of the decay rates that we've been been playing with these are are not the absolute decay rates. They probably vary from place to place. If you're in a in Manhattan, where parking is scarce, you're probably going to be willing to walk or take transit for a longer period than you would be in a place where there are plenty of free parking and lots of car amenities. So, but as a general rule, um, walking people's willingness to walk starts to fall off pretty quickly after a minute or so. Whereas people's ability or, or, or willingness to take auto or transit, it, you know, a five-minute trip is as good as a one-minute trip, really, and then it starts to fall off. So this is where where we take um, some exception to the Minnesota approach and some of the other approaches that simply say we're going to look at we're going to declare something accessible if you can get there in 45 minutes. We think a, a five-minute trip is a better deal than a 45-minute trip. And a 45-minute trip isn't that much different than a 46-minute trip. So we're going we're gonna to count trips out almost to infinity 
but they're not going to be as valuable to the traveler as a very short trip. So we're going to value the short trips the most, if that makes sense. And if anybody's played around with uh, WalkScore, the, um, the um, startup um, app that is now used to sell apartments mainly, that's, that's the undergirding logic there as well. Uh, we think further that there are two metrics and two important metrics. Um, there's a work metric. Uh, work, of, of course, uh, is you know often front and center because it's the congested time of day, and because we're so focused on congestion, often that's the only thing that gets considered. But it really is the minority of trips in VMT on the system. Um, but we we want to have a work accessibility measure. It's obviously important. We do want to use the decay rate, and uh, we, we, at least at this moment, are using decay-weighted jobs as the, as the metric that we're looking at. Um, there's some issues with that because it's not, until we set standards, it's not exactly clear what a decay-weighted job means in terms of policy, but um, uh, I think that's a surmountable problem. For non-work, we're using an approach that is similar, again, to walk score uh, as access to non-work typical non-work destinations, um, neighborhood type accessibility, things that you would do every day or every week. Um, that accounts for the majority of trips. So leaving that out of the equation, if people just look at how many jobs I can reach in X number of minutes, you're leaving a lot out. And you're not only you're leaving out the decay rate, but you're also leaving out the non-work trips. So we really want to use them. Um, and similar to walk score, we're using a, a, a scoring system based on uh, a basket of, of places that you could reach. Now, there are examples of analyses where you might want to just look at one thing in particular, food deserts. So how, how accessible are groceries by walking in low-income areas? So this isn't the, the be-all, end-all. These are just sort of the top-line metrics that we're working on as, uh, as scanning and um, potential performance measures. So then here are some results. Looks like you can get pretty much all your needs met in the Madison area by driving. Um, now the scale that comes off the shelf, this is using sugar again, the, the scale of uh, um, you know, what is good access is pretty forgiving, I think. And we, one of the issues, again, not so much a hardcore research question, but a decision-making exercise is to um, find the right scale for um, what is good and what is poor accessibility. And we have in mind maybe a, a survey to try to get at that. So the, the sugar tool comes with a pretty forgiving one. And so by car, at least, everything is, um, every, every place that is in the tool is accessible. And what this means is, in the given neighborhoods, how accessible are, are non-work destinations to me? And it's all undifferentiated here because all the neighborhoods are really at the top level, pretty much. But when you go to transit, you see some of the neighborhoods start to be differentiated. In the Isthmus area, the central Madison, if you know Madison, this is our downtown between the lakes, we call it the Isthmus. Um, it's where there is both lots and lots of transit. All the buses funnel through the Isthmus, and they circle, circle around our state capital. Um, it's the transit hub. And there's a great density of destinations there. It's a, it's a high density uh, urban environment. Further out, where transit starts to become less available and or destinations become further out, you get lower and lower transit scores until you get to places where there is no transit at all and it's zero. So even in this, this suburb here called Maple Bluff, the buses don't go in there. Um, this is a, a yet another take. This is walk score. This is the walk access score, uh, similar again to the trademarked walk score, but done with sugar again on the scale for sugar. Um, and you can see that there are places that are, again, downtown is very dense, well connected, and uh, density of uh, destinations. You get, this is a wealthy area here that is um, very car oriented and so uh, not very walkable, but those folks chose to do that. Bigger problems come in down in this area, if you know the area where it's lower income but uh, not very accessible by foot. And this is a place where that might be very critical for folks who don't have any other options. Uh, here's a, a job, job access by transit in terms of decay-weighted jobs. Again, a function of both where the jobs are and the transit. 
uh, we start to see some of the low-income areas here really having some, in the terms of that Rebecca was describing, connectivity issues. And I'll show you in a minute an overlay of low-income and job access. Here's an exercise we did. I was on the plan commission in Madison until recently. And one of the last things that we did, and I frankly voted against this, but uh, whatever, went through, was a greenfield development on the fringe of Madison uh, in this area, which is right now uh, fields. Uh, the developer originally wanted to build a sort of new urbanist um, uh, subdivision that would have neighborhood-oriented retail in the center. Um, after the recession, the different financial constraints took hold, and they decided they would just only build housing there. And so the walk accessibility score is quite low um, as a result. Uh, there is quite a bit of uh, retail over here, but it's separated by a, a highway, and it's difficult to access. But if we put the mixed use that they had originally proposed or something similar to it in, you see how much that it bumped up. And if this, if our staff and plan commission had done this analysis, we might have come up with a different uh, outcome in terms of pushing the developer to meet at least some minimum critical standard and accessibility. Here's another um, exercise that we did. There's a plan afoot uh, among our, uh, our community college system to move a downtown campus, which is highly accessible, but um, they think they might be able to sell to a developer and pocket some money down to not that far away, only a mile or two away. Um, but it is this is right by the transit hub, and number two is is on a heavily. It has good transit here, but it's certainly not the hub. If you want to go to number two from the west side or the north or east side, you have to transfer and come down this way pretty much. So we looked at, um, in terms of um, what would that do in, in terms of households within 45 minutes in transit? Well, you can see that from one to two, there's a decrease uh, around 11%. But if you really look at a more nuanced view, you look at different time bands, you see some real big effects at the low end where people are really going to, um, you know, where we had some real convenience that goes away. And if you just look at average travel time, instead of 10, 11%, it's about a 22% difference. So that's where we think that uh, just the 45-minute cordon is not really as telling as it could be in, in this more nuanced view um, tells decision makers and planners a lot more. Here's another analysis that we did of a new bus route. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's the dark black line. This is a low-income area that's really uh, was poorly planned back in the 70s. It's cut off by water, freeways, and, and open, uh, undeveloped land here. So um, a lot of low-income folks ended up down there, but really had very, very limited access unless they had a car. And they're being low-income. That's a major burden. So this was a way to look at the effect of um, this new bus route and what job access it creates. Um, and you could, if you had this tool, which they didn't, but if you had it, you could look at different solutions, different routes, uh, to see which one uh, optimizes the, the bang for the buck. And it's interesting to note that not only does it improve job access along the route itself, but throughout the system, because people can connect to this new bus route and get to places where they couldn't before. So for example, people down here, which is also low income, could come up here, get on this bus, and then have some more. They, this indicates a relatively minor, but you know, some increase in job access there too. If you want to look at if, if decay-weighted jobs is uh, too abstract, you could actually look at real, actual jobs. And as you can see before, this place was so isolated that transit you had to walk so far to the bus line that there were no jobs. Um, I don't know what the one was. Somebody had some business in their garage or something, but you um, could access exactly one job within 15 minutes before, and now uh, within 45 minutes, you get you know, fair, fair, pretty significant increases, at least in percentage terms. Uh, I mentioned the equity analysis. This is that. Here again is the jobs accessible by transit on a decay-weighted basis. I had showed a slide like this before. It just was in a different color scheme. Um, then we overlay where the, the high number of low-income people are by neighborhood. 
and the color scheme is maybe not perfect here. We need to work on that. But the places that are bright red without the green overlaying are the places that you might want to go look and see. These are the places that, again, in USDOT terms, are disconnected. And people who live here know this, for example, next to the airport is a big trailer park, which has poor um, access to jobs by transit because there is probably no bus stop nearby. A uh, bunch of apartments here that are lower income, some down here. So in practice, um, uh, there, this is starting to ripple out. This is a short list of places where we've had conversations or actually done work in uh, operationalizing accessibility as a, uh, a measure or an analytical tool or, or, all of, or for all of the five ways that I mentioned before. You just heard about USDOT, California. Caltrans has a new strategic plan that we were in involved in and, uh, and is working on a transportation analysis guide and has pledged to develop accessibility measures, which is really exciting for the, you know, the size of California and the weight that the shadow that they, they um, cast on the field. Virginia has already started using accessibility measures in project selection. They're just getting through their first round under the HB2 process, which I think is really interesting. Um, there's room to improve it, and they know that, but they you know, they pulled together in short order some, some really interesting project selection measures, not only accessibility, but around land use that uh, I think people will be interested in. Hopefully, we'll do a webinar on that in particular. Um, Renaissance, the, the partner that I mentioned at the beginning, has also done some work with Maryland DOT and local units of government on uh, potential BRT and, and TOD looking at uh, accessibility measures and trying to predict uh, use of the system. Um, and in, in what the effects on accessibility would be. So I have a few slides around that. Here's the HB2 criteria. Um, it'll be in the slides if folks want to access it later, and you can certainly, it's easy to find on the web. Uh, some of the ways they're starting to talk about accessibility, this is VDOT, looking at neighborhood level accessibility. Now, Virginia is interesting because they run so many of the small roads. So they've always had a more of a uh, orientation toward neighborhood level concerns than DOTs that really run the NHS or just the freeways. Um, but that said, you know, they, uh, so much effort in the past 50 years has been on moving regional traffic on big roads. It's, it speaks well to them, I think, to be able to look at um, accessibility at the local level. And this is a problem that, that um, an accessibility tool would point out that there's a metro station here and a bunch of people living here, and you can't get from here to here without driving circuitously around on congested streets. So there's a plan to um, add some accessibility in there. And I'm sorry that this cuts off, but I, if I made it, showed the whole thing, you wouldn't be able to read it. But you have to trust me on what it actually is. Um, this, this is a, sort of a bit of a tangent, I won't go into it too much, but another thing that we've been working on that goes hand in glove with accessibility is looking at trip making. So these are GPS traces of tri trips in the area that I just described. And it's, this is how many trips per day are, are beginning or ending down here where the station is um, in cars, and how many might potentially be able to convert to bike pad, or at least to shorter car trips. This is something that Renaissance did with the accessibility tool. It wasn't sugar, but very similar in logic. It's a proprietary thing. They use ArcGIS and spreadsheets to determine where poor access is, where there are strong producers of trips uh, and attractors, so uh, producers being housing and this being uh, a shopping area, and why, you're not, why the accessibility is poor there. There was some kind of a no man's land there where there was not very good uh, pedestrian accessibility, so that's in Arlington where they're going to try to connect that up so that it's easier to walk. Um, this is, again, something you might want to look at if you get the PDF later, but uh, this is how Renaissance has used accessibility, relative accessibility to determine mode choice. It looks complicated, but it's really, really not. It's pretty straightforward, and it's worked out pretty well for them. They validated it and gotten good results. And in doing so, um, this is one of the analyses they did for um, where uh, a potential new transit accessibility and, and TOD would be, uh, again. Um, and I, if you're interested in this in great detail, I could put you in touch with them. They have done really good work. 
Um, and finally, we're almost to the point of questions here, but I, as I said, I think that um, most of this has been worked out in the literature. Lots of it is now available off the shelf with sugar, um, maybe with a little guidance from a consultant. We're always happy to try to get people going. Uh, we do need to come up with terminology and standards for what what is good accessibility and what accessibility means. We need to maybe do a little bit more work on the decay curves in different situations, but I think the decay curves themselves are essential to having a robust accessibility measure and uh, tool. Um, in terms of the market basket of destinations at the non-work level, we need to probably do a, a survey or um, Fine-tune the defaults that come in the in the accessibility tool from City Labs. Uh, it, it's it's fine, but it, there's probably work to improve that. Bike walk networks are not always perfect uh, in terms of impedances, be it hills, safety issues, um, time it takes to cross big highways. So um, that's something that could be done at the local level if somebody's using this tool. But it, you know, the more that that's built into the tool to begin with, the better. Um, and there are some transit systems that are not on the GTFS, so that is uh, important too. And so now with that, I'm going to desist, and we have about 20 minutes to take questions. Unmuted. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to unmute everybody. Um, and I'm Maybe going to... Maybe I could just ask Matthew if he had anything he wanted to add to that, since so much of our work uh, revolves around his tool. Matthew would... Before we start taking questions, and maybe as Robbie's getting them queued up, anything you'd like to say about this? Oh, he's muted still. I think he muted himself, so he's going to have to unmute Matthew, you're himself. muted if you're trying. There you go. Okay. All right. I'll figure out. I'll click harder here. Um, no, I thought it was an excellent overview of some of the applications and stuff. And, you know, as we pointed out, there's a lot of different research ongoing and Obviously, we're looking for partners and collaborators and stuff to help really suss out some of these issues, and especially when it comes to defining kind of the acceptable standards and um, in these kind of measures that are being applied today. Okay. Um, well, Mary Ebeling, my colleague, Sorry, we have a little bit of echo because we're in the same room. But she's been reading through the uh, she's been reading through the questions. So I'm actually going to mute myself, and I'm going to let Mary um, read through some of the questions that have come in. But while she's before she does that, I just do want to remind people, uh, in case they want to jump off or need to jump off, we will have a recording of the webinar up on the website tomorrow. We'll also have a copy of the slides up so that you can look at some of those uh, formulas and, and contacts that we you may not have gotten a chance to. And also, if you have not typed your question in and you're not sure how to do that, just uh, type it into the chat box. And again, you can find the chat box by clicking on the little orange arrow in the right hand upper right hand corner of your screen. So I'm going to let Mary go ahead and read those questions. Um, and I'm going to mute myself so we don't get an echo in the room. Hi, everybody. Um, I've been quiet until now, um, but that is about to end. Um, we got a ton of really good questions in during this very awesome webinar. Um, the first question is really a two-part question. It's more informational, um, and there's a couple of websites that are referenced, and we'll put them up um, when we put up our slides. Uh, the first questions are, you know, is anybody, uh, anybody who presented, are you familiar with the transportation cost index that Oregon is pursuing? And there's a website, in case people aren't familiar. Um, and then also um, whether or not USDOT has been um, um, working with defining connectivity on this TRB website. Um, this is really a question for Rebecca primarily, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, that uh, I, I know I personally haven't been involved in, in that work, but um, I do believe that there are people from um, across the department who have been working with the TRB committee to, to do that. And I'll be happy to try to figure out who that is um, if, the, if the person asking the question would like more information about who's involved. OK. And Rebecca, I'm sorry, there's another question for you right off the bat. Um, 
would you be able to provide more specifics about how USDOT will be taking FAST Act provisions uh, related to transit-oriented development uh, and fostering connected communities? Um, sure. The, so the provisions that I was uh, referring to are new. Uh, there, there were changes to the TIFIA and the RIF programs, which provide loans for um, for transportation projects, um, they brought eligibilities for TIFIA and then, and then rail projects for RIF. And both of them have new language that each is a little different, um, but they now enable us to provide financing for transit-oriented development. Um, for the TIFIA, it refers to um, public infrastructure, so I think that that is more still transportation infrastructure that's um, near a, um, a fixed guideway or multimodal rail station. Or there's a list of um, types of, of uh, transit that's eligible. Um, but so it expands our ability to finance those types of developments. But then the RIF language is actually quite, quite broader. Um, it it's refers to commercial and residential development, I believe, is the language. And that has to be. Um, functionally related to a rail station. Uh, so it, it expands our ability to build sort of transit supportive densities around our existing assets or, or around new assets. So we're really excited about about that. And I think that um, you know we're still in the process of trying to figure out how we will implement that so that we are making loans that are um, you know, credit worthy and, and will result in, in beneficial projects and being good stewards of federal money. But one thing that is sort of a thought of mine is that these measures on connectivity would be very helpful to understand um, if something really is transit oriented and is a walkable community and it has, it has real access to the rail facility. Um, because you know, there are different, right now I think that the Federal Transit Administration has a catchment area of um, three quarters of a mile, but you know, that as Eric sort of explored, three quarters of a mile can, maybe that's the right measure, maybe, you know, maybe there are different ways and three quarters of a mile in one location can feel walkable and in another location not. And, and so anyway, I think that we'd be interested in understanding how this type of analysis could improve um, our, our uh, project evaluation. Okay, um, that was an excellent answer. Um, we have a question um, requesting a, a maybe a more detailed explanation of the decay factor. That's pretty much for whoever wants to take it. Well, so I gave it my best shot. I don't know, Matthew. Maybe you could maybe you can explain it better since it's also a part of your tool. You want to take a crack? Would you mind uh, bringing back up your slide that had those curves on it? Oh, God. Oh. Basically, the decay factor has to do with how much I am enjoying uh, reaching my destination. And so um, I think uh, we're a very car-centered culture, but for the most part, we would all like to walk to a grocery store if it was pragmatic to do so. And so if I could walk across the street and get there in three or four minutes, then that's fantastic. And I might actually walk to the grocery store and uh, uh, make those trips in that way. But what the decay curves say is that as, those, as that walk gets longer and longer, my accessibility to that grocery store becomes less and less and less. And so um, really over, and this is, uh, you can see in the purple um, line here, uh, you've removed half of your enjoyment to that grocery store by the time you reach eight minutes uh, walk. And so you're only 10% enjoying that uh, grocery store if it's a 25-minute walk away. And so this gets to um, a reflection on, obviously, the grocery store is a good example. I'm not going to hike all my groceries back for a 25-minute walk, likely. Um, however, even with accessibility to jobs, and this is true, you know, even far outside of the U.S., and um, in many places where people travel a very long distance to get to work, that 
there really isn't this kind of strict cutoff of if I can get to a job in 30 minutes, then you know I, it's a accessible or not accessible. And so um, how I think of the decay curves is much more about uh, you know how how practical is it that I would go to a job there. And so a job that I can get to in 10 or 15 minutes um, certainly is extremely appealing. And I'm located in Atlanta, which we used as a fantastic example of horrible uh, accessibility, I guess, earlier in the presentation. Um, but if I'm traveling an hour to get to work, uh, just because it's accessible and I can do it in an hour, um, those jobs that are an hour away um, should be uh, scored much less than a job that I could get to in 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm not sure if that helps or not, but uh, it's how I think of uh, these decay curves anyway. Anything else to add? Anyone? Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the next question then. Uh, how can state DOTs apply this methodology to the anal analysis of proposed transportation projects? Uh, including analysis of new land uses and land use projects. Um, I think this would apply to evaluation of roadway or arterial network changes as well. So the answer is in a lot of ways. Um, if you have a particular project um, in mind, so, so the question went to land use and, and transportation projects. Um, the you know, um, stumbling around here to see where we start. Um, let's say that there's a, a, a new highway project, just for grins, that somebody is proposing. Um, and you want to know what is the effect of that going to be on getting people to where they want to go faster, by all modes. So one of the things you would look at is what is that going to do to the to the walking mode and the bike mode? It may foreclose some accessibility um, getting across that highway. You're, you're um, creating a barrier. So that might be one thing you look at. Uh, you mentioned land use. You might, in your scenarios, look at a land use um, a land use scenario that brings destinations closer together in a comp planning process or something that eliminates the need for the highway. So you might weigh them against each other in a cost benefit. The highway costs this much, the land use change costs this much, and it seems this feasible, and um, they, you know, which one is better. Um, certainly the highway is going to um, affect auto based accessibility, usually in a positive way. Um, although, again, this is not primarily a, a forecasting tool, but you could get in and affect the road network, add some capacity there, which would mean to probably speed it up um, if it's widening a highway, or adding a link if it's a new highway, to see what the resulting accessibility changes are, which would be very similar to the, the uh, bus route being added that I showed. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. It, it really would depend on what your what the goal of the project is and what the policy goals of the department are and of the community um, and accessibility could help you understand how close you're getting to a lot of those types of goals and if I can just spin I one other thing that kind of comes to mind is um, that uh, this measure of accessibility really starts changing the focus from uh, adding capacity to the roadway and what are we doing to improve a particular section of the transportation network and it turns the question around to who is it that we are helping by adding this bit to a roadway or the network connectivity or whatever the case may be and so in a, in a lot of ways when we look at these projects today it's about speed and delay and congestion and reducing that and in the end, the only thing we're really measuring is, you know, are things improving on this section of the transportation network? But we're not measuring things on, you know, are people better able to reach their destinations? Have we, you know, affected these, uh, this uh, type of trip making or the activities that they are doing? Um, and who is it that we are, you know, helping with some of these things? And is that in line with the goals we have for the community? Um, 
the other thing I would mention is, you know, with these advanced tools, you start to look at um, the the example earlier with it's very common now to look at accessibility by kind of drawing a circle, a three-quarter mile uh, buffer around a transit station. But in many cases there, you're just looking at um, who's living around the transit station, but not necessarily where they can go. And so I've seen projects that would greatly enhance accessibility by bringing transit to, you know, a new uh, commercial center or, you know, kind of a manufacturing industrial area kind of a thing. But by all kind of common means, you draw a circle around it and there's no actual population that's there. And so we go into kind of this level of accessibility analysis that we're talking about here. You start looking at who is it, um, and it looks at how is it benefiting that entire trip, both where people live, but also in accessing these kind of key destinations, and how is that changing. Can well, I just add, is, those are great yeah. points. Can I just add one thing that, um, that Matthew's comments made me think of? I think that particularly the visualizations, which are fantastic for this, uh, the sugar access tools, I think could actually be a really helpful tool in facilitating the kind of community engagement that helps to shape what the public priorities are. So it's not just about prioritizing the projects according to your priorities, but, but figuring out as a community what the priorities are and, and enabling your projects to meet those goals. Because the, these, the way that it actually you know, presents the, the visual I think, is very tangible and helps people understand what they're getting from a project. So we, we actually have um, a couple of questions here. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> uh, we have a couple questions here about um, how the transit scores were um, derived. And I think maybe if um, Eric or someone else could go into the GTFS um, and what that means. We had a couple questions about how you account for scheduling, like whether a bus comes frequently or um, hourly, and maybe just explain a little bit more about how you got that, because we had several questions about that. I think Matthew would be the best person for that, since it's his tool. OK. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Um, so one of the things that Eric talked about early on in the presentation is this kind of matter of data. And as we talk to organizations around the world, it's it's always the number one question of, well, how do I get my information into this? Or, you know, how do I even begin to get started? And we have four transit agencies and, you know, how do all these things mash together? And so one of the things that we worked really hard with Sugar Access is to supply all of that data required um, up front so that on day one you have this database. Now, Eric mentioned the GTFS file. The GTFS file originally started out as a standardization that Google put forth and uh, approached transit agencies and said, if you will, uh, put your data into this uh, general transit feed format um, then we will route and show directions and stuff through your transit system on Google Maps. And so now it's very common that transit agencies put that out. Um, and so by default, when we um, start and deliver this for a new area, we will take uh, commercial roadway um, and point of interest information, um, land use data, and then uh, we will go and bring in the most current uh, data set from the transit agency. By default, that's through the GTFS files. Um, if those are stored in any other type of format, we will certainly work with you to uh, bring those in so that they're all linked up to the roadway network and understood. But that includes absolutely the full information around the transit system, including all the stops and detailed schedules minute by minute. Now, as the software goes through an and analyzes what will become a transit access score. It's calculating travel times through the network. And so this is absolutely from, uh, it's basically looking at every single, you can kind of imagine a block by block analysis, and for every block in your city, it looks at how far can I get within defined travel time ranges. Um, and so it's okay, I'm gonna leave my house and I'm going to walk along the network. Um, so it's going to encounter barriers like rivers and uh, freeways and things like that that Eric pointed out in his example. 
Um, and all that gets accounted for in this walking travel time through the network to get to a transit station. It's going to consider, okay, now that I'm now that I'm here, what is my average wait time as I arrive at the station to get a service? And it goes through a very sophisticated analysis of the services that are running them um, through your system. And so, uh, you know, I'm in D.C. for TRB a couple weeks ago. You go to get on the metro, and you may have four or five, uh, two or three different uh, metro lines that are all kind of running using this, coming through the station on similar track space. Um, and so in that case, it actually considers kind of, okay, well, my, you know, it bundles all those together, and depending on where my destination is, it's uh, taking into account that I could have used any of these routes and stuff. Um, but when you go to transfer and stuff, it's considering the actual transfer times from the schedules. It's considering your in-vehicle and out-of-vehicle time. So it's a very sophisticated look at what an actual trip looks like as it is kind of simulated to move through the public transport system. Okay. And uh, we did have just one um, question, which is a little bit of a follow-up on that. And someone asked about whether this included um, sidewalk coverage so that you know whether it's even safe or possible to walk to the uh, transit stop. And maybe also that has to do with people with mobility issues as well. Yeah. No, excellent question. Um, so the data, the commercial data sets that we use are per, that we use are produced by here, uh, formerly known as Navtech, I guess. And inside of those networks, um, along roadways and stuff, it's a fairly aggregate um, look. It definitely doesn't look at if there's a sidewalk or not. Instead, it is, you know, is walking prohibited or not along this roadway. And so obviously, it removes things like. Um, your freeways and that type of thing that you can't go walk along. Um, what's nice is it does add in a lot of stuff that is prohibited from cars. And so you get bike paths and walking trails and pathways through parks and things like that that are um, included. Now, Sugar Access City Labs is probably more commonly known for Cube or travel demand modeling software. Um, and Sugar Access uses the exact same data formats as that, which are all based on Esri Geo databases. And so I know um, for this uh, MPO in Madison, Wisconsin, um, when they received the software, they uh, took a sidewalk and uh, bikeway inventory that they had and was already stored in ArcGIS and has kind of mashed that together with the all streets commercial networks that we supply. And so that's a fairly straightforward exercise that we can help you with or, you know, your GIS staff is likely able to uh, to add that. And then once that's in there, you can absolutely access any of those attributes like must, you know, walk on a sidewalk or don't walk on a sidewalk. Um, we're also adding in features to kind of uh, uh, score it differently. So maybe you incur twice the travel time if there's no sidewalk versus um, if there is a sidewalk to get it, kind of that relative uh, measure of accessibility. Great. Um, we uh, we have quite a few questions left. I know we did get to two o'clock. I don't know if people are able to stay on a little bit longer, but um, if they're not, um, I just want to remind anyone uh, who didn't get their question answered that you can definitely email, well, you can certainly email um, SSTI uh, and we'll be glad to uh, handle your questions as best we can or send them to the people who can answer them. I'm going to uh, just go ahead and put up the slide for SSTI so that you can get our um, our contact information and um, Rebecca and Eric and Matthew, are you still able to? Well, it looks like Eric's gone. He might have had another call. So, Rebecca, are you able to um, stay on for a few more minutes? Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm and, fine as well. Okay, wonderful. Well, if people are still able to stay on, I'll uh, take a few more questions. And um, there's our contact information if you didn't get your question answered. We'll try and route it to the right person. Um, so the person who asked this uh, apparently has left, but I will just ask it anyway. Uh, how would this tool be used to evaluate roadway or arterial network changes? Or could it? 
Yeah, definitely. And it, so that all um, comes into play with uh, the network that you have available. And so in many place, places, like in Chicago, it's it's actually quite interesting to measure accessibility by car versus by transit because in these dense urban areas, transit will often beat the uh, vehicle travel times. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely, you can add in new roadways, you can add um, in different capacity changes, you can change the bus routes moving down. Um, for the actual impacts of that, um, if you add a new capacity, as Eric mentioned, maybe that you want to assume kind of a different speed profile or something inside of that. Um, but it will add in, obviously, you know, if, if I can walk down that or if we run uh, new transit services down that. Um, so, yeah, the, the physical kind of transportation network changes are, you know, absolutely, you know, one half of the puzzle uh, with the land use side in defining this accessibility. Great. Well, um we have a question which I'm sure Matthew can answer, or at least maybe he can answer. Uh, someone actually wants to know how much it costs to buy the Sugar Access Program. Um, because of the data relationships uh, that we have, it's it's actually uh, scaled slightly by the um, size of the city or the metropolitan area, or if you want a you know statewide data set or something like that. Um, but for a you know medium uh, sized metropolitan area, it would be uh, eighty five hundred dollars. And so it's we pushed on our data vendors uh, quite hard to uh, get you the best quality data um, that's kind of ready to go right out of the box. Okay. And then someone also also wanted to know if you have a webinar on learning sugar access. Yeah, so on the City Labs website, um, there is a detailed webinar um, that it has been put up that kind of walks people through the software and more of the use cases, um, and that's www.citylabs, uh, C-I-T-I-L-A-B-S dot com. Um, and then we are planning a technical webinar as well that specifically deals at kind of the internal workings of the software and I'll have a white paper on all the methodology and stuff posted here in the next couple of weeks. Okay. And um, I'm going to make this the last question because we are losing people, but, um, and Eric has uh, ha had to take another call, so he can't answer this, but has uh, USDOT explored the possibility of using these accessibility maps to support public participation? I think that's kind of an interesting uh, question. Yeah, that, I mean, I it's a great idea. As I said before, I think that this, it's a fabulous tool for um, for public participation. Um, and I don't know if we if if we have guidance available on that. Um, but I, it's definitely something that I'll uh, take back to the folks who work on on that, and um, we can talk about. Okay. Thank you for the suggestion. And I think from the SSTI side, um, I think mostly the answer is we're just beginning to learn how to how to use this. So we haven't really gotten a chance to test it out in the public participation realm. But um, I would expect that, you know, it's certainly a tool that could be used uh, once we kind of figure out how we're doing this. I think that's sort of coming down the road, uh, no pun intended, uh, in our uh, coordination with uh, the city of Madison. And with that, I do want to thank everyone for uh, joining us. We had a great uh, group of people, great uh, questions, and um, we do have some upcoming webinars. We have a newsletter. You can follow us on Twitter. You can find out all about how to stay in touch with us at our website, www.ssti.us. And there's our Twitter handle as well. So thank you, everyone. We will try and get the recording of this up as soon as possible. But certainly, it'll be up uh, tomorrow at the latest. And we'll have a copy of the slides up as well. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, SSDI.